Hi, I'm Brian Lowry, professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. Um, and this is Leadership for Society, Reimagining Work Post-COVID. Um, today, we're talking about mobility, and I'm excited to have two guests. Um, Christina Sass, who is the co-founder and chair of Andela, which scales high-performing engineering teams by investing in Africa's most talented software developers. And Lala Maristani, who is the director of external affairs at Bitwise Industries. Thank you both for coming. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Great. So, um, Laura, let me Laura, let me start with you. Can you share a bit about your background and the work that Bitwise does? Sure. So, um, Laura Manistani. Um, I'm originally from Puerto Rico, but I've been in the D.C. area for about 16 years, um, working across civil rights organizations, um, really focused on increasing representation across uh, government and uh, philanthropy, uh, most recently working uh, at Democracy Fund, leading a strategy around constructive politics to try to bridge uh, divides across America, and uh, recently joined Bitwise Industries, company that has been operating out of Fresno, California since 2013 with this idea that uh, we can take tech economies outside of Silicon Valley and to underestimated cities and people. Our founders, uh, Irma Olguin and Jake Soberall, um, had been working, um, had left Fresno and decided to come back to really think through how they could bring their stories um, into the city and also how we could help support building a tech economy for the underestimated folks in, in a place like Fresno. So I look forward to talking a little bit more about what that looks like. Fantastic. As I understand it, um, Bitwise has three business lines. Is that That's right? right? So Bitwise Industries, um, when if you go back to 2013 and you think about what was going on, particularly with government, there were a lot of incentives to get more people into STEM careers. There was a lot of push um, coming out of the Obama administration to help communities um, figure out how do you upskill into technology? How do you create coders across this, the, the country? And so what, what was going on is if you look at places in middle America, if you look at places like Fresno, if you come in with only the element of upskilling, it falls short because you basically need to rethink the entire economy. So if there's no demand for all these coders because there's a lack of digital literacy, business owners don't even understand how to engage, how to engage effectively with technology, then who do you sell your services to? And so folks that were learning how to code and were coming into this, these careers, they couldn't find a home back home. And so Bitwise Industries, the way that our founders sort of envisioned was restructuring all of it and really thinking through through the three lines of business that we have now, how do you set up that ecosystem? So the first uh, piece of it is workforce training. We look for folks outside of traditional paths into the workforce. And then we very purposefully look at what are the barriers that are keeping those folks out of the workforce and we eliminate them. So we eliminate them in the short term by um, trying to figure out, do we need to connect these folks um, to government services so that they can make it through the night, so that they can have a roof over their heads, so that they're not going hungry? Essentially, anything that is going to help these folks uh, be able to focus on learning. But the biggest barrier to learning is actually being able to have a salary. And so we have the nation's most diverse tech apprenticeship program. We pay people to learn. Um, and so what we do is we place them on um, jobs uh, that we're producing technology for across sectors through our second line of business, which is our tech consulting and software development firm. So on those projects where we're working with state and local governments, we're working with private sector actors to build uh, technology, to create um, better and strengthen digital infrastructure, we have cohorts of apprentices paired with senior developers. And those apprentices are earning between 16 and $22 an hour, and they're getting full benefits to learn. Um, the third piece of what we do is we house all of that ecosystem in revitalized uh, downtown castles, um, as one of our co-founders will call them. And those places, really, because the folks that we're working with, they have to see themselves be part of that ecosystem. So if you're in Silicon Valley, you are, every time you go to a bar, all the people around you um, are going to potentially be in your network. Same in D.C., right? So in government we're all here and so it's it's fairly easy to develop those networks in the places that we're going into that's not that clear and so in our buildings you have the tech startups 
you have um, te other tech companies uh, as our tenants, you have the Bitwise ecosystem housed there, but then you also have low cost co-work options around $39 a month for the individual. We have the local nonprofits, and then we have all of our classes um, taking place there so that folks really can um, physically be in that space with um, the future of technology, with mentors. Um, and it, it, it just it is able to produce um, kind of the full circle of what that ecosystem looks like from being a, a pre-apprentice to actually launching your own small business. Great, so thank you for that. Um, Christina, I'd love to hear a little bit about Andela. Sure. So we started Andela in 2014 and we were taking very high potential, but early in their career software developers and giving them extensive training about nine months um, of training in actual product teams, building products. Um, and then we placed them on client engagements. And so the, um, our clients looked like um, high growth startups in the US, sometimes in the UK. Um, occasionally um, in uh, Africa and Asia more broadly. But um, over time, that really developed into a kind of two separate spheres. One was training and moving up of, uh, of great junior talent. And the second part is really supporting um, developers who are working remotely. And so today, Andela operates in 32 countries, um, still very much rooted in um, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda. Um, that's certainly where the highest concentration of developers is. But now, uh, since COVID, we really focused on building the platform where clients can connect with diverse talent and international talent. And so it's both the um, how to match well how to vet and match talent really well, and how to support that talent um, remotely. So happy to expand on any parts of the business. Like. Yeah, so let me um, let me ask a question for, to both of you. How, how has COVID affected the, the work you're doing? Christina, I'll start with you. Pretty massively. <laughs> so in 2014, it was uh, our hardest, uh, our, our biggest challenge was convincing people to um, consider remote teams who hadn't yet or who hadn't at scale. Maybe they had worked with one team um, in the past and um, it wasn't, it, it just wasn't, uh, that was our biggest barrier. And so we even it really ended up stopping attempting to sell to people that weren't already convinced on remote and distributed workforces. And COVID massively changed that. And so in 2019, um, we uh, made some changes away from the training model um, because we were having trouble convincing people of remote junior talent. In 2020, uh, we, like everybody else, hunkered down and looked at, um, you know, what the, the health of, of the businesses that we were selling into was going to be. But what happened as a silver lining of COVID was that it just, it, it accelerated our ability to convince the world about remote talent by, I'd say, a decade or more. And so, um, we've we've just seen massive, massive growth and adoption of remote talent coming out of that. And so the, the last six to eight months have been the highest growth we've seen in the company. And um, yeah, it's it's we, we had like many dark days where we were wondering how it was going to all happen. And then um, this is an argument that we've been making for ages is you're no longer confined to the talent that is down the street. You're confined, you can, you know, imagine what the exact best talent is. And so, um, and so that is part of what we actually, um, moved away, all went entirely remote before. So we had physical offices in, um, a huge office in Nigeria and uh, campus in Kenya. And now all of those people are, are remote too. And that has allowed us to be a lot more nimble and focus on the platform itself. Um, and so now, as we said, 32 countries represented, I should probably check, it's probably even more today, but it's been um, a, a very positive silver lining coming out of a really rough time. Uh, I guess there's some silver lining in there. So that's, that's, that's something, something. Uh, Lauda, what about you? How, how Bitwise, how are they affected by, how are you all affected by it? The well, I want to I want to thread a little bit on that, what we mean by COVID, because during the pandemic, we've also seen um, an uptick in social justice movements um, and a lot of the, what that has brought with it, um, unfortunately, for the wrong reasons and for the wrong um, uh, kind of 
kind of kind of catalytic moments um i would say but the thing is that as during the pandemic inequity has become so much more um stark and obvious and clear um and more people have sort of woken up to what that means we get a lot more folks asking how do we build more equitable communities how do we build more inclusive communities and so in that um in that movement bitwise has thrived because mm -hmm. for the last eight years eight plus years what we have built um has been based on the assumption that diversity has always existed but that what we needed to do was build more equitable on ramps for people and so there are actually very few places where uh, you can find the models uh, on how to do that so if you think about it a lot of our system what it has supported throughout the years is the movement building piece it really is how do we create the awareness um, so that we can deal with the issues? And during the pandemic, that inequity has created a lot of awareness. And so what we have folks asking now are, where are those models that can tell us how do you build equity? What does equity look like? It's not some like Wall Street thing over there. It's actually thinking about systemic barriers. And so our model was built on that premise. And so that I think is one of the places where we have seen a lot more growth. And in fact, um, during the pandemic, Bitwise has gone from Fresno, California um, to now four cities in California. So we are in Bakersfield, Merced and Oakland, West Oakland. And um, we are also launched. We also launched our first city outside of California in Toledo, Ohio, and have and will be announcing new cities uh, coming soon. So rapid expansion across the country definitely like any other company uh, we did have to go remote uh, our model is meant to be in person we have been able to serve a lot more folks during the pandemic and we will consider whether a hybrid model um, persists into the future but our ecosystem is meant to be in person we want to be able to support folks um, in that environment and to be able to have that environment um, to be able to support folks across their uh, tech journeys um, but definitely, um, I think there's, there's uh, to Christina's point, um, in all of that sorrow and unfortunate um, circumstance, we too have seen um, the potential for growth. Yeah, so I, I like that you brought up the perception, increased perceptions of inequity. So I'm going to ask a broad question now. First, do you think we live in a meritocracy? No. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, I don't. No. Okay. So what would a meritocracy look like? What, what would that look like? So where, where are we now, Christina, you, you, you have a position on this. Where do you think we are now and, and what, what would a, merit, a true meritocracy look like? I'm truly most knowledgeable about software developers. So I'm mm -hmm. going to speak in that space, but um, I told you uh, the primary challenge was talking to people about distributed and remote teams. The challenge right underneath that was convincing people of, of you know, different kinds of talent and that that, you know, was uh, truly worth their worth their time. And uh, I could say a lot of that about that. There are a lot of learnings that happened in that time. But what a true meritocracy looks like, I think, is um, part of where where we're headed with things like AI. So, um, well, let me take a step back. Um, if you look at something like the world of sports, I think they have appropriately leveraged data analysis to remove a lot of bias. Okay, so if you're Ronaldo, no one asks you in an interview how you feel about, you know, whether you're a good teammate. They don't ask you like how you feel about striking the ball and do you do that well? And no one cares. They have been watching and analyzing um, every single one of your movements, and it really is, it's, it should be more of an unbiased, uh, unbiased opinion. Now, I don't think that we can neatly fit all career paths into that, but what does a meritocracy look like for software developers? It looks like, can you build the thing that we need you to build? Can you do that thing? Do you have evidence of that over multiple years? Have you, can you prove that in um, a blind platform where no one has any idea of your background, your gender, any other affiliations? Can you do the thing that you need to do and does it fit what I need to do? And then you would get paid a market salary that is comparable to everybody else doing that job, no matter where you, um, you know, no matter where you're from. That would be a meritocracy in the world 
world of software development. Mm -hmm. So let me let me let me push a little bit uh, on this, Christina. So you use a um, a football or in America a soccer <laughs> a soccer um, metaphor here. But the thing about um, football soccer in particular is that every it's really easy. The entry is really easy. Anyone can pick it up as a kid. All you need is a ball and some space. And so around the world, people can just play. And there's a constant looking for the best talent. Yes. Right. So there's the Perfect. the barrier to entry is is relatively low right mm -hmm. but as i as i understand and it's really hard to get into andela is that still true so i've, I've heard that um what what is it that you had an acceptance <laughs> rate of one percent <laughs> so how, how do we how do we think about barriers to entry when we think about things like equity and yeah. meritocracy so um all that is fair and we did have like a very um, low percentage rate. And that's part of the reason why we went to places like Nigeria um, and Lagos, where there's 17.3 million people. And um, the talent that we found was wildly underemployed. And um, but and, and so I, I would hope that those software developers would tell you our earliest software developers would, would tell you that it was like not a perfect system, but it was a, a, a pretty good proxy for like you're promoted based on merit, not on even even not on the knowledge that you had coming in and so um so we did things like map your learning velocity so not how many times not, not like your your um your score on a test but how many times did you go back in and what does that tell us about the way that you learn and how are you engaging with other parts of it that that's a hugely important part um and now we have a thing called the andela learning community which is exactly what you said and actually laura it sounds like some of the one of the pillars that you described at Bitwise, it's um, it's an opportunity to be exposed to entry level software development and see what it's like, see if it's a fit for you, and that's entirely free. Um, and now we've had hundreds of thousands of people who have come through and done, um, sometimes partnered with Udacity, um, sometimes with other online training portals and in person meetups to say, hey this is a career path for everyone. This is a career path for women. This is a career path for people who did not get a four-year degree in computer science. Uh, but you do have to, you've got to, you know, work your way up and there's lots of tools for you to be able to do it. So here, get a taste of it. And if we see the patterns that we see in highly successful problem solvers, then we will throw more challenges and um, or, or offer you resources to continue to upskill. And um, through that, hopefully what well, our intention is to build ladders to move everybody up not to build walls to keep everybody out um, and just find multiple ways for people to be um, a full-time mid-level or senior level developer and then have a full-time job so i can jump in here and talk a little bit about um you know the, the bitwise model and why it's a little bit different um in in some of the respects again because it's so anchored on equity so the first thing is that the folks that we are trying to reach are not in traditional paths into the workforce. So they um, either are not seeking a degree or are looking for a new career path, um, or there's just too many barriers where a degree of any kind is not feasible. Um, we aren't working um, necessarily with, you know, high school pipelines. Like we really are looking for the folks that are um, excluded from our system for whatever reason. And then the first thing we do is we don't test them out of our programs. So we spend a lot of time just understanding the individual. Um, and really, the the educational piece of it, yes, creating a little bit more of a conscience um, and information on what does it mean to be in tech, because in the places that we're in, just that word can be overwhelming. Um, and and even when you're thinking through the the local economies in those places and how you're thinking about increasing awareness about the tech economy, like just those words are overwhelming for people. And so we spend a lot of time um, just bringing people in, opening up those beautiful castles that we're building for folks to come in and experience what we do, whether it's, you know, with a beer um, or on a town hall meeting. And then when we start to get folks interested, we do have beginners courses in our pre-apprenticeship program and they work like a stack so if you do maybe you do one or two and then it turns out that there's uh one of our apprenticeships where uh, the project is more on creative design um and you don't need to have like all five stacks um you could you could do it with one or two 
Um, for other projects, it may be that we need to find folks that have, you know, three or four or more courses that they've taken um, and are a little bit more specialized. But there is opportunity at different levels of the process um, to, to be able to engage. So that that is um, one piece of it. We do, to your point on whether this is a meritocracy or not. So one of the things just narrative wise that we face is that even though a lot of the sectors that we're producing technology for are also feeling the push to diversify and they will say that they care and that they want to do that, technology feels high stakes enough that folks don't know how they feel about having people learning on their big tech projects or they don't know how they feel about having formerly incarcerated cohorts of apprentices on their big tech projects. And so that is also one of the reasons why at Bitwise, we are, we're able to sort of leverage that because we are producing the project. So we don't necessarily have to justify our clients. In many cases, they don't, they don't really want to know who's behind the technology. They, they just want to know that they're getting the best product. Um, and they will, because we are producing the most representative technology um, out there just because of who's behind it. Um, but, but those are still significant barriers that we face um, when you think about uh, building stellar technology with a representative workforce and who you're building the technology for and how they perceive who's behind it are still significant barriers um, as you're thinking about upskilling folks. Um, and then degree inflation. So the, we still definitely face um, that a lot in the system. Whereas e what, you know, we do provide kind of to Christina's point, that resume, that, that skill and experience. But in this space, you still um, get a lot of, you know, where did you go to school? What's your background? What's that degree? And so I think, you know, we need to do a lot more work in, build, you know, working through those barriers because that's not the path um, for everybody. Got it. And uh, Lana, what would you, what was the, what are the metrics for your organization? Like what, what are your goals and how do you measure whether or not you're moving towards them? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends through the lines of businesses. We obviously want to be able to serve holistically the individual. So for those pieces of it, how are we achieving that? How are we making sure that those folks have access to the right kind of mentorship that they're not um, dropping out of our programs, right? That they have all of the necessary um, supports and we work across sectors. That's that's also the beauty of our model. We um, are able to bring in different resources to support ho folks holistically. So we do a lot on wraparound services. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, one uh, really great example of it is in Fresno. There is uh, one of the biggest systemic barriers is the lack of accessible transportation. And I mean, to the extent where folks like us that are in major urban areas you know, uh, getting a Lyft or an Uber is so easy, even when you're in the um, outside, just outside the metropolitan areas. In Fresno, that's not an option. Um, there are just days where you're waiting for an Uber for an hour and they cancel on you four times, right? So even if you wanted to pay for folks and give them those sorts of stipends, that's not a possibility. So in the long term, we work across sectors to try to figure out how do we fix this. In the short term, we built our own busing system. And so we, we go pick people up. Um, and we bring them to us. So it's really thinking through those those places and what are the actual barriers um, and, and not making assumptions. I think the other piece of it is we all talk about scalability. Scalability in the Bitwise model is not that we're going to do the same thing over and over again for this, you know, for a bunch of people. It is that we are going to take that those ingredients um, that are hyper focused on the individual and supporting the individual holistically. And we're going to apply that method throughout. Um, and we're going to be able to figure out like, how do we support folks individually? How do we bring the resources to do that? Yeah. So I'm happy you pointed out this, you pointed to uh, systemic barriers and the busing is an interesting example because I, I would think, and I assume most people would think that's a, a concern for the government, right? So I guess I wonder where do you draw the line between what should be managed by places like Bitwise or yeah. Uh, philanthropic endeavors and what should be pushed as policy shifts, right? So you which you're talking about mass transit is, is what we're talking about right now. How do you think yeah. about that that line? Yeah, and that's um, I think that's what I was alluding to in, in terms of how you balance the short versus long term. So mm -hmm. in the short term, Bitwise will figure it out. Um, and that means we will go and find the resources wherever we need to find them, whether it's through government grants or it's working with the private sector or philanthropy to be able to support building whatever it is we need to build to eliminate the barrier in the short term. In the long term, 
it's Bitwise as an anchor, working with community organizations, working with local government to think about how to fix the system. How do we need to reroute that bus <laughs> so that it is um, getting people to where they need to go? How are we going to work with um, those same cross-sector partners to be able to change the system? And another piece of it, so because our model is so anchored in serving these individuals that are outside of the traditional um, system, we from the beginning are already forming very strong relationships with the community organizations that are trusted partners in community that are the organizations that understand those problems the most those are the same folks that are helping us access that on tap talent so from the beginning we are reaching out to the organizations that are leading on second chance employment we are working with the organizations that are um, engaging with veterans and engaging with single moms. And so those networks, that cycle is already there. So then we start to leverage it to think holistically about systemic barriers in our community. And what do they look in, 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 in all our cities, they all look different. Like the strategy on how we are going to be able to tackle those barriers is very different across our cities. So I, I'm going to stay with them on this for just a second. Do you think government should just get out of the way and let people like you do it? Like what I mean, so I know you said short term, long term, but if you're providing busing and you you can do that at some reasonable scale, should we just give you, should we, the people, give you our money and have you fix it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think that there is uh, definitely a role for government. Um, and I think that that role varies again across uh, cities and states. I also think right now, um, just given the huge influx of dollars, right, that are going out to communities through to be able to deal with uh, COVID and to respond to COVID, it's an incredible opportunity to think about what kind of infrastructure can we build in those communities that helps sustain into the long term, especially because they are one-time funds, um, these these sorts of efforts, right? So how you're thinking about, I think one one barrier that we often encounter from the government side of it is that everybody cares about upskilling people. Everybody cares about workforce development. But the reality is that government doesn't really have all that much money to actually do that. They have money to do broadband infrastructure. They have money to do like the, the infrastructure itself, the product itself. And so how do you then help align all of the goals because the beauty of being able to build that digital infrastructure to, to expand um, broadband access in a community while upskilling folks from that community, to be able to stay in that community and maintain it long term. And how you think about that holistically, I think is the opportunity we have now that there is also, there's not only the resources from government, but there's also the awareness, a little bit more awareness of what systemic barriers are and how we need to address them. All right, you said something that I'm going to come back to, but I'm going to I'm about people staying in the community. We'll come we'll come back to that in a second. But yeah. um, Christina, I want to um, ask a little bit more about Andela. So you all work in um, a number of countries in Africa. Um, and who do the people your alumni, so the people who come through your program, who do they work for? What are they are they primarily working for US companies or, or what's the on the other side of being in the program? Um, what are they doing? Yeah. OK, I'm so excited to tell you that answer, but I didn't want to interrupt. But I just wanted to comment on the last conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously a very different context, Lagos, Nairobi. But um, I could not agree more with Laura that you have to understand the person that you seek to serve. And so we um, in the early days of Andela, we bust people. We compensated them for safe, safe measures. Um, and, and really our goal is listen, like we don't, what we know about you is you have off the charts, problem solving and logical reasoning. And that's regardless of what you did before this, we know you, that you have great potential based on these indicators of future success. What is stopping you from being successful? We built dorms, for people to stay in, having no desire to be in the dorm business. <laughs> but um, the biggest barrier was their transport. It was three hours one way with a brand new you know, computer that was absolutely necessary for them to learn. Um, and they were just like literally not eating uh, while they were you know, in transit and doing these things. And so we also backed up to 
hey, what would it, you know, how do we remove all the barriers for you to focus on just unlocking your potential and doing this thing all day long? Mm -hmm. And so we did not have um, any uh, illusions that like suddenly transportation would radically change in that context. But we did get to a scale, a level of scale where we had negotiating power and we were like, we don't want, we want you all to be you know, economically sound and be able to move out of the dorms. We also can negotiate on your behalf really good housing that's nearby. And that to me seems like a reasonable role um, for for business that is that is engaging with, you know, these types of populations. Like in Nigeria, you often have to have two years rent upfront. I mean, I didn't I couldn't have paid for two years rent upfront until I was in my 30s. Um, maybe. And so uh, so we too started with the individual and just knocked down what are all of these, um, you know, and then we became like dorm managers and all sorts of all sorts of wonderful things ensued. But it was not a responsibility we wanted to keep forever. But that is a part of this picture of of, you know, moving people up that are not going to be, you know, high revenue generating right away. That's the part you have to figure out in order to do it. Okay, now alumni. <laughs> oh my gosh, our alumni are doing such crazy cool things. So they are um, software developers um, at you know very high levels in a variety of different companies. Um, some are international. Most of them have have stayed at uh, in their home communities, and then. Uh, a huge subset of them proportionately are starting their own companies and they're employing each other and investing in each other. Um, and so our goal, you know, 10, 15 years out is to have CTOs and leaders who are ethically minded technologists who know what good looks like in best top tier companies that then go back and seed their own ecosystems and are funding each other. Um, and so we're already starting to see that happen from our earliest, earliest cohorts. So they're at, you know, Carta and they're at um, Goldman Sachs, some of them. Uh, one of them just started at Harvard Business School. They've been Obama fellows. Um, and then I would say the large majority of them are um, senior, senior technologists at um, kind of, we were really focused on like the Series C, Series D high growth. And so a lot of them have moved into those type of companies or more enterprise level companies. I see. And are are they um, typically leaving Nigeria? Are they are they working in this in the states, or I mean, and also Kenya and the other countries you work with? Yeah. My understanding is the primary. I mean, the primary country is still Nigeria and, and yeah. Lagos. So, um, are they typically leaving? Some of them do. We were um, for with our earliest software developers. We asked them to commit to four years, and um, part of our goal was to. Um, to move the world faster so that they could be doing these jobs from wherever they want. Um, but some of those folks have definitely had better offers in from other places and are out doing that thing in Canada, in Germany, lots of recruitment, especially from Nigeria to Berlin, um, and in some cases also in the United States um, and the UK also. And then um, most most of them are have moved into either global companies or or local companies. Um, and then I said, as, as a, you know, probably probably ten percent are engaged in startups and or employed at a, a startup that um, that you know someone from Mandela they knew is is starting. So like a, a pretty high percentage, which is thrilling to us. Got it. So, and this is this is for both of you, but I'll, with Christina, I'll, I'll stick with you, and then I'll, I'll give a lot, a lot of chance to answer. Um, one th one of the things that I'm always curious about when we have these kind of um, these kind of programs, which seem great, like I, they, it's really fantastic the, the work you're doing, but there seems to be a tension between supporting the development of talented people who don't get a chance, right? So that and that's I think you all are both making trying to make sure that happens in the communities you're in, and supporting the community. And those things are not necessarily the same thing, right? So you can take, you could imagine basically, uh, here's, here's a, 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 I don't know, negative, but here's a, a controversial way to say it. You skim off the, the, the most talented or the most talented people that come through your door and then you lift them up, which is fantastic for them. It's great that they have that opportunity they wouldn't have had otherwise, but then they often are not staying in the community Right. So is that community better off or worse off as a function of those 
people leaving, right? So you think about this in the States, it's like kind of a talented 10th model. So I, I don't know if you, you, I'm sure you both, yeah. some of you both have heard of that, where it's like you find the most talented people in the community, you lift them up. The idea initially is that then they will lift up the community. But the reality is the talented 10th, when it was originally generated, assumed segregation. Right? Like, so it assumed yeah. that you're going to give these people all those skills and they would be forced to stay in the community because there were barriers to leaving. Mm -hmm. And so the community would benefit from those talents. And what we're saying is like everyone agrees that that's wrong. Right. I think now in the world, no one thinks that if you're talented, you should be forced to stay anywhere. You should have the opportunity if you're in if you're born in uh, Lagos and you're good at something, you want to go to Berlin or you want to go to Ottawa or probably not Ottawa. You want to go to Vancouver or Toronto or L.A. and and benefit. Fantastic. You should be able to do that. But again, what that often does is means that the people who did not have that opportunity or the people that were missed are actually in a worse position than they were prior. So how do you think, um, both of you, how do you think about that tension, like supporting the community versus supporting the advancement of individuals that are in that community? So I don't know, Christina, I, I, I'll, I'll start with you. Lots of thoughts. I don't think there's a perfect answer. I think you have to be clear about who you serve primarily. And if that's the individual, you have to support the individual. And so we talked to our software developers a whole lot about how the tech ecosystem evolved in Silicon Valley and how we could do it better. Um, and I think thankfully mobility in this digital world does allow for a developer in Ottawa to do a lot of supporting of the tech ecosystem in Lego. So that's one thing. But I also think that we have to uh, have a reasonable time span. I think for lots of our developers, they need to, to go out and see what good looks like and, and experience multiple different parts of a tech career. And then they may very well choose to, to rebuild in their, in their home community. So I experienced that, but what I experienced more often is um, people that, that, that they've met, they desire to uh, invest in and engage in in multiple ways. So even if they're like, my path is taking me to a huge company somewhere else, um, they're investing in each other. So my co-founder, I have two co-founders, um, Nad, Nadir, and Ngesi, and then E, who we call E, but his name is Ian Alua Abayeji. So both of them have now started multiple subsequent companies. So one was Flutterwave, an international payments company to allow people to much more fluidly do exchanges with Nigerian companies at first. Now it's much more global. They are doing phenomenally well. And he started a second uh, fund called Futures Africa. And I'm an investor in Futures Africa, and I would bet 15 other Andellans also are. And so he's investing kind of all over that, you know, Ni Nairobi also. Um, and so I would imagine they're doing that particularly if they're not there and they feel an obligation to, you know, to that place. And, and we've really talked to them a lot about how that actually happens, how one founder or two founders can seed an entire you know, ecosystem of other, of other developers. So we're starting to see that. Um, we're starting to see that. So it's complicated. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not shortchanging what you said it is, is very complicated. And what's even more complicated for us was not where they choose to go after, but um, when we're trying to put, we're trying to, to really build, you know, lifelong developers that are at the top of their game and they're priced out of their, that local market. That was an extremely, um, you know, we had a lot of questions about that. Should we offer a product that is, you know, very on par with the, with local prices or should we, you know, really seek out, um, top, top tier software development and, and have that be market rate. And that was a, you know, a big challenge for us as well. So, um, no perfect answer, but those are some of the ways that we thought about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, a lot of your, your organization is very explicit about going because you started like these, what did you call them? Underestimated cities. So you you talked about it at the level of the, the city, not at the level of the individual. And you said, and this is why I was going to come back to you. I'm wondering if the people you train, if they really stay in those communities, because even it's uh, Lagos to Toronto or Ottawa is one thing, but even 
Fresno to, to the Bay Area is a thing too, right? So when people have those new skills, um, are they leaving? And how do you continue to support in the development support and lift up the community in those cities that you start in when people have these new skills and they might want to go someplace else with them? Yeah, and I think it, it, it is complicated, but what is simple is that the very the very core of our model is to make sure that there is an economy in that region that can support that talent. Um, a lot of the folks that are coming into our programs from the beginning, one of the um, barriers or opportunities are that they want to stay home. So these may be folks that have, they're anchored there. They have their families there. Um, when you're coming from a lot of the disadvantaged backgrounds that we're serving, these folks, one of the biggest challenges that they have is that for those kinds of communities, when, you, when you're going out to college, it kind of feels like, what do you mean you're gonna go out there and spend money and just sit and like not work? No, you have to give back to the community, right? So those are the folks that we're serving. They're helping to bring back for their parents, they're taking care of their parents or grandparents, right? Like multi-family homes um, that they're a part of. And so it isn't uh, either that easy to also uproot and leave. And so our model is also really focused on how do we then leverage all of this to make the community better so that there is economic mobility within that community so that the technology in that community is benefiting from that talent. And when we call them underestimated cities, you also have to think about what, is that, what exactly does that mean when you have a place that small businesses don't even know where to start to have a website um, that can engage the community more meaningfully. So one example, during the pandemic, thinking through all of those small businesses, all of those um, restaurants that would have, if they weren't able to get technology to get their uh, menus out there and to be able to take orders online, what, what were they going to do? Right. And so there was Bitwise to come in and literally go door to door talking to them and explaining to them the value of technology and then having the ability to build it for them. Why were we able to do that? Because the folks behind that tech are the ones that understand the barriers in the community the most. Um, so I think it, it is very complex and we see, um, we actually see a lot at the hyper local level. So in terms of transition um, rates, number one, at Bitwise, we do end up hiring a lot of them because we have expanded <laughs> very quickly. Uh, and the other thing that we've seen is local government, the school districts also bringing those folks in in house and, and starting to create those pipelines. So I would say we actually haven't seen all that much of people moving out. Um, but it, it would be beautiful in all of the ways um, if you were able to strengthen that digital infrastructure locally, if you were really focused on what the gaps and the barriers were, you leverage that more representative tech workforce to be able to be more responsive to what the community needs to build for that community. Um, and then that in turn creates opportunities for them to stay at home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, mean, I have one more question for each of you, but it, it just made me think about the um, complexity of economic development of areas. Because on the one hand, you don't want people to leave. So that means you have to bring resources in. But that often means that a lot of people who aren't high earners, I mean, as, as people come in and opportunities increase, the cost of living in those areas also increases, right? So it's a, I think it's a, it seems like a real challenge to, to solve those problems. So um, I, I really appreciate the work both the organizations are doing on it. Um, so let me, here's my last question for both of you how would you reimagine work moving forward right so this is COVID is i mean it's been the pandemic has been really hard in a number of ways but it's also created incredible opportunities so uh, as you think about what the world could look like post pandemic what would you like to see change um christine i'll let you go first i would like it to be wildly more diverse and more merit-based and um, less dependent on any type of pedigree uh, and better systems of tracking for how you add value and solve problems in, in different contexts. Um, I think that, that that has happened to some, you know, to, to, to in a meaningful way. And now we have to make sure that our messaging really 
really lands that um, that this is about you know this is about incredible talent and um, and how we um, you know continue to seek to unlock people's potential. So I think you know we've we've opened a lot of hearts and minds to ways that that you know we haven't worked in the past, and now I think we're going to open up a whole lot of other other problems, problems for HR departments who are trying to you know um, create policies across multiple different locations, um, and uh, even just something as as you know uh, adherence to local laws, those types of things for. Um, people that live in radically different places and what it does to the local economy to suddenly pay market rates. All of those things will bring um, will bring challenges that we have to thoughtfully answer. But I am I am hopeful that um, AI in combination with humans that are empathetic and want to unlock the potential of their employees can really yield a better a better meritocracy. And COVID, um, for better or for worse, really did. Um, push people towards a distributed model. And I think, by the way, I think distributed works for people in Lagos. And I think it works for people in Fresno who just want to work from home. I think that, you know, it is a uh, can be a win for um, for both of those types of communities. And Lada, you have the last word. I think well, how do we empower more people to be able to um, be to define what their uh, workforce is going to look like, what their economy is going to look like? How do you um, kind of bring more people into that conversation? How do we think through the systems uh, approach to these problems? Um, a better understanding coming out of the pandemic, definitely on the complexity of the issues that we have to fix. And I think um, as we think about ourselves of, of humans and how our brain works, that that linear approach is probably not, is, is definitely not going to be the answer that we need to be able to hold all of that complexity as we're solving problems in our communities, that it's not going to be one button, that companies, the private sector has more flexibility to be able to address um, the problems directly and in partnership with um, community and government organizations as well. So it's kind of taking all of that understanding of the complexity of this moment, plus um, where we are and where our systems are, and how we reimagine how we reimagine them um, into the future. All right. Well, um, it was great to talk to you. Thank you both. Thank you. Pleasure great to be here. Thank you. So next week, I'll discuss worker worker activism and politics in the workplace with John Russ, global marketing leader and former head of global marketing for Coinbase and Jason Freed, CEO of Basecamp. Hope you join us then. <laughs>